All right, so the second panel is going to be more about sort of how technology affects uh, language work uh, for uh, sort of non Well, we have a translator on the panel. So for, so for people who are in the business of translation, whether they're in the enterprise or they're managing a language service provider or they're a translator or uh, if they're a translation educator uh, working in a localization program, what skills are needed for the next generation of people doing serious language work? Um, so I'd like to invite Katie again, who's going to moderate. Who she's doing sort of double duty tonight, um, and the rest of our panelists to come up who will introduce themselves. So. All right, can you all come up here? Um, and I will pass the mic on. To one, if there's another one for you. Go ahead, Max. Oh, you can. Yeah, you can introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Max Troyer. I'm an assistant professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies down in Monterey, formerly the uh, Monterey Institute of International Studies. So we've been training translators, uh, interpreters, and local speakers for a long time. Uh, my name is Dave Snyder. I'm uh, currently a global, my title is globalization architect at LinkedIn. I started out there managing the globalization team, and then about a year ago moved to think more about the future rather than operations. Before that, I worked for a organization doing Amazon Web Services, and then, full disclosure, I spent about 14 years managing organization teams at Microsoft, and now I'm back at Microsoft. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you to have you. Uh, my name is Anna Schlegel, and I'm uh, the head of globalization for NetApp, also the front end strategy head, um, and I'm one of the founders of Women in Localization. My name is Jules Tetsch, I'm a translator, English to German, and I also write about translation technology and research. Thank you so much, guys. And um, I think we're going to start with a framing question for Anna, actually. Um, and just to get us started, um, can you tell us how you've seen tech impact enterprise localization over the years, um, throughout your career? And are material changes happening to enterprise localization organization and budgets? And if not, if they're not happening currently, um, when do you think they'll actually start to happen? These are two different questions. Oh, well, th that's sort of one, one broad, broader question um, to kind of frame how things are changing in the, in, the in the organization of localization departments currently relating to, to machine translation specifically. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so um, I remember in 96, I was at Cisco at that time. Mm -hmm. We were already playing with machine translation, and I remember doing the first test, and, and uh, at that time, the CEO was John Chambers. And um, we brought him in to do a test. <laughs> we were like, the CEO of Cisco is John Chambers, and we tried Spanish, and he said, um, el presidente de Cisco is Juan Recamara. <laughs> and we're like, oh boy, we have to start training these engines. Um, and now, you know, many, many years past, we're still, <laughs> still training engines. Um, and uh, when NT was just in the past, um, kind of like a pilot and the future, it's very much present today. And because of um, NT or raw NT or machine translation plus close editing, I think our budgets go stretch much farther. I think we have some part of financial in there. Um, and so reuse is huge. Um, in many instances, we are trying to use raw and key also. So yeah, I mean, the budgets go way, way farther um, nowadays. Is that, is so that would, you say, would you say that, the, um, that you've seen a change with the localization <laughs> budgets related to NT? Um, no. Do you think so that I will? I think every head of globalization needs to make that decision. I, I think, I don't know, maybe David has a different opinion, but it's up to the lead of localization or director or the head to start investing and go for it and try it out. And if you fail and you try to try and it's not for everything, we're, um, we're a center of excellence. You know, we, we can't use MT for everything, but we, we're sleeping living everywhere. And um, I get a, a report every Monday morning. Because as for two or three years, I told my team I want to see that with MT, I want to see that with MT, it wasn't happening. And I 
said every Monday morning, 9 a.m., this report my inbox. And now I see, ooh, you know, how we're using it more and more and more. And um, I'm letting them see the more we're doing, the more budget we're putting up, and the better it gets. But it's up to me, and because I said so, no executive is going to tell me, like, you should be using it. They don't know. They don't care. I yeah, you know, I think back to, uh, gosh, about eight years ago when I was uh, in the team at Microsoft that was responsible for localizing support content, knowledge-based articles. And we had about 200,000 English language knowledge-based articles. There's no way we could human translate all those for under a you know, billion dollars. And so MT allowed us to do a lot more with our budget. We, we, we kind of piloted raw MT of of knowledge-based articles. We started in Spanish and started picking up languages one by one. And eventually we got to the point where we were doing, by the time I left the team, I think we were up to 14 languages that we published for IMT. There's no way we would have been able to do that on our budget. Uh, so you know, I think I think technology does definitely you know, reduce your costs and allows you to do more with less. And um, David, oh, did anyone else want to address the question? So the, the next question is also for David. Um, if you were going to start a localization department from scratch, um, how would you organize it? Who would you hire? What would it look like? Yeah, I think it would depend on this sort of company. You know, if it was a company that was uh, agile and willing to take some risks and do experimentation, then I'd probably hire a bunch of engineers. And, and that's about it. I, I automate the workflow, I push everything through MT, I build some uh, post-editing capability, you know, human uh, post-editing capability, either professional for certain types of content, and community post-editing for other types of content, and try to get into that virtuous circle of pushing out MT and, and letting our customers and, and the community correct it for us and improve the MT quality. With maybe a company that was less, uh, less agile, more traditional, yeah, I think I'd probably implement something that looks a little bit more like the current globalization model today, where you leverage human translators, uh, post-editing, and then a small amount of MT for the sorts of content where you can get away with like support content. Anna, do you have any thoughts on that? I would, the first person I would hire is not a localization expert. The first, it, it depends, right? Because you, there was the Google case, um, or it, it depends where I would work, it depends on the type of business. If I could redo what, where, where I am, which is an engineering company where one product has one billion lines of code, um, I would get strategies or countries, what really makes sense, you know, because highly um, deep engineering environments don't need a lot of organization. Um, a lot of engineers, you know, in back doors they prefer English anyway. So it's very different. It's very different if you work at PayPal or at eBay or at VMware. I mean, it's very different thing. But yeah, I, I think that the first person I hired was a TMS expert because I saw that TMS was already in the company. So I'm like, oh, we need to clean this copy up. And, you know, and then we immediately brought in multi terms and databases and and, and keys. And, uh, we, I would also put people in the country to feed back, you know, the requirements, stuff like that. We see a lot of products just being pushed, pushed, pushed from headquarters in the state, and I, I don't like that. I prefer that the, the field tells us exactly what is it that they need to make their AOPs, and um, not everything is needed in every single country because not every single country is equipped to um, take so much. You know, it's like the baseball picture mentality of like the stage of the school. There's so many projects, so much content, and these smaller uh, offices are get, getting overwhelmed. So it depends on the company. I don't know if it was, uh, you know, it was Skype or <laughs> a whole other model. Yeah, I'll add one more thing, and, and it also depends on the content. Uh, for any company, I think there's certain types of content that you just can't push through raw into. You know, legal content, high risk content, high liability content, where you can get sued if something goes wrong. But uh, so it also, it also depends on the company and it depends on the, the content you're looking at. Thanks. Um, so, Yost, this next one is for you. Um, and 
I think that uh, it's fairly well known that translators are rarely interested in technology per se. They see it more as uh, a means to an end, an investment that they make uh, in order to be relevant to the industry and the job that they actually want, which is to translate potentially more as artists or something along those lines. Um, so what would you recommend for translators in order for them to keep abreast of the rapidly changing technology? Um, before I answer, thank you, by the way, for, for having um, me here and having a number of other translators here. I think it's a really, um, really remarkable thing to happen. It doesn't happen, but it actually it happens. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, um, thank you for, for um, making that happen here with um, instance. Hmm? No, no. <coughs> um, so, uh, you know, when we, we met um, to before this panel, Online and and um, talk about some of those questions and and um, and the obvious answer to the question is they got to read my newsletter. I mean that you know that that's quite a lot. Was not the answer, right? Um, so I think what translators have to do is um, we we had a panel at Localization World also, which was quite interesting. I thought and some of the some of those those issues were addressed there. I think that what um, translators are for one thing there's you know, 300,000 translators. So any statement I make about translators is incorrect, right? It's, it's, a, it's a vast overgeneralization. And, and that's, you know, that, that's an important uh, asterisk to put on any statement, I think. But in general, I think one could say that translators, when technology first came around um, in the late 90s and early 2000s with translation memory and, and terminology databases and, uh, you know, quality assurance, processes, et cetera, et cetera, they were not particularly eager to embrace it. I think that's a generalization that we can all sort of buy in. There's obviously exceptions to that, but many were not very eager to embrace it. And it took, um, you know, it took them, you know, something between five or eight or so years until they started to embrace it. And then they embraced it very, very strongly. And I think that embrace, embrace that, that embrace is still happening. And they really like what they have. And they, so, so they have uh, started to use technology that is rather complex. You know, if you look at um, some of the tools they're using, they are relatively complex tools. And they are quite eager not to let go of those tools. I think. They're quite eager not to necessarily uh, jump into the next phase of, of um, technology which includes thing, things like you know, browser-based um, translation editors and, and cloud-based systems, and of course, machine translation. So um, it, I think it would be not right to say that translators don't use technology. They do. They're very, very good about using technology. But because it took them so long to jump on board and invested quite a bit of, I think, expertise and, and, and money and, and time and whatever to, to, um, to learn those systems, it's not easy for them to give up that. I think that's that's certainly one one thing that I think can be said said, said fairly uh, safely. And and I think ma machine translation is of course a whole different beast altogether, right? Machine translation, um, I think especially here in the U.S., translators have made actually more progress, if you will, to accept machine translation as something that they can use in their workflows compared to other parts of the world, and I think that's partly due to work like, like Mike Dillinger, for instance, and the, <laughs> it was like, I gotta wake up. Um, well, but the AMTA, the American um, Association, this is the worst name in the world, the Association of Machine Translation in the Americas. They were getting up with that, you know, <laughs> phrase. But no, that's the organization that, that um, has co-located number of co conferences with the ATA, and, and so there has been a lot of back and forth between the machine translation community and and um, translators over the last, you know, five or six years, and and, and that I think has borne fruit, almost ten, um, and and that has borne fruit to some degree. But um, I think that part of the problem, and that's probably maybe going a little bit beyond your question here. Part of the problem with machine translation for translators, aside from the fact that many do feel threatened, still, I mean, that, you know, those questions were addressed in the previous panel. Um, is that the way that machine translation is being 
deployed and used is not a way that is typically particularly productive for translators, nor is it something that empowers the translator. What I, what I mean by that is this. Um, so when LinkedIn or NetApp or, or, or whatever kind of company that has a highly trained machine translation engine uses uh, that engine to post edit it, that makes a lot of sense to get to a highly trained engine, right? I would guesstimate that, that maybe 3% of all translators get to those engines. The 97% that are, the, oh, might, it might be 90% or 89 whatever, vast majority of translators never see those engines. What they see is, is the, the untrained you know, Google Translate and, and Bing Translator and now DeepL and of course Look and whatever, you know, Look, different story. But, but I mean, so, so what I'm saying is that the, the engines that translators have access to are not the highly trained engines that make sense to post edits. The engines that we have access to typically are the engines that where post editing is not possibly the best way of dealing with, uh, of making us more productive. Does it mean that we shouldn't use those engines? I think we should use those engines, but maybe in a different way than post editing. We should be able to find ways to get the data that those engines offer, not necessarily on a segment basis, but on a sub-segment basis, on a fragment basis, wh whatever. I mean, there's many ways you can use machine translation if you just look at it as data that you can use, just as you can use memory, term basis, whatever. You know, all kinds of other databases, corpora, whatever you might have. Right? And, and I think that's sort of where maybe you or you know whoever you is, what we don't help ourselves if we connect machine translation and post editing as if it's like one thing. It's not. Machine translation is a technology, post editing is a process. They have they can be connected, but they're not they're not born together. They're not like Siamese twins, right? And 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 so I think what we need to do is cut those twins apart and and you know and maybe find better ways of, of, of dealing with it. Thank you so much. Um, and Max, this kind of leads into um, the question I had for you, which is um, given the change in technology and everything else, how do you um, at MIIS keep abreast of the technological changes? How do you update your curriculum to affect those changes? That's a, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough issue. Um, and if we go back 30 or 40 years when our, our program was founded, we really focused on translation and interpretation. And that worked for quite a few years. Um, it was a little bit over 10 years ago uh, that uh, our, the people in charge at our school started realizing that uh, alumni were coming back and saying, you know, it would have been really cool if I had got uh, some technology training uh, at this school or you know some business skills might have been a little bit handy for what I'm being asked to do these days maybe as companies started moving from uh, you know in-house translators to moving to an uh, outsourcing model where they're hiring these language leads to lead departments that are kind of managing the outside vendor uh, translation quality and so they're they're kind of becoming project managers and requiring they're, they're required to speak with people that they're not used to speaking with uh, not just other translators so um, uh, we, we were inspired uh, to create this uh, translation and localization management program. Uh, and this, this is the idea that uh, the, the translator, I think there was a talk at local, the translator is dead, long live the translator, something like that. Uh, and, and the TLM program definitely uh, responded to that uh, idea in the sense that you, it doesn't make sense to, to become a, a, just a translator anymore. Um, we, we need to be giving people uh, localization skills, cat, cat tools, uh, MT knowledge, uh, and then also add in those business skills. And so we have a, an MBA program at our school. And so we, uh, we the TLM students take a number of, of MBA courses as well. And up until uh, just last year, this was a one size fits all program. Every TLM student uh, was required to have near native second language. And so every TLM student that graduated could have become a, a translator, even though uh, roughly 80% uh, went into project management. Uh, and I was invited a couple times up to the guilt group that I think David and, and Anna are both in. Uh, and I, I basically had my, my he head handed to me, GILT group, yeah, uh, my head handed to me on a, a plate that um, you know we don't necessarily need our localization professionals to be near native in their second language. They don't need to be translators. We need people who have really strong technology skills uh, and maybe some really good business skills as well. And so 
very recently, the TLM program went through a change. In fact, this fall was our first cohort where we split the program into three, uh, three programs, a translation specialization, a localization specialization, and a management specialization so that incoming students can kind of decide, do I want to focus more on the language side? Do I want to go more into those deep localization skills? Or do I want to really focus on the business side of, of what we're doing? And so it's, uh, it's wildly successful. Um, for, for many years, our program was around uh, you know, 30 students every fall. And we opened it up to this uh, new system, the specializations, and we, we doubled the, the size of the program. The incoming class was 60. Uh, and this was uh, capped at 60 because we just don't have enough classrooms. Uh, our admissions team uh, wants to uh, grow the program even more, potentially up to 120 students in an incoming class. And to me, that is just mind blowing because I don't know how I'm gonna uh, find enough classrooms and enough faculty to teach these courses. Um, I, I've already talked to David about some ideas of bringing some people down to help out. Um, and what, what we're looking at is um, you know, our post-graduation numbers. And uh, for, for I've been teaching now for six or seven years. And uh, our, our post-graduation number is about a year out. 90% of our graduates are, are working in the industry. And that, that, has maintained, that has been maintaining pretty stable over the years. And so um, my big question to the, our admissions team is, if we keep growing the size of our program, uh, will we start seeing a drop? And I, I don't believe it. Um, I've, I've talked to a number of other educators from, from North America, and uh, we, we kind of agreed, uh, Jan, Jan is here, uh, from University of Washington, and um, we, we, we're not really competitors. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be competitors for a number of, of years in the sense that we can graduate, uh, I think we can all graduate kind of an infinite number of professionals as this industry grows and grows. But one thing, the, the thing that I'm gonna kind of close on is that uh, we have a translation program. That's our bread and butter for the last 30 or 40 years, right? We're down to about uh, six students that are applying for our translation program. Uh, and that may sound kind of shocking, like we're failing, but all of these students have, uh, have migrated over to the TLM program because what, what, what is the value of a traditional translation degree? There, there isn't, I, I personally do not believe there's much value in a, in a pure translation degree. Um, without that technology, without the technology side and, and the business side. Um, and anecdotally, I've talked to uh, some educators from Europe at Loke World, and um, when I, I, I had to, I mean, we're, <laughs> I feel a little guilty that our program is doing so well because I hear that these European programs uh, are, are not necessarily doing so well because they're in these university systems that have a long history and they're very slow to react. They're not introducing CAT tools fast enough. I don't even think they're really talking about MT. Uh, very much, and so these kind of programs are, are wilting. So uh, we have the, the benefit of, I'm the program coordinator for the TLM program, and so I, I'm really reactive to the, the needs of our, our graduates. I have my ear uh, up, up here to the, the Bay Area uh, trying to figure out what kind of skills uh, our graduates need to succeed in, the, in these companies, but uh, yeah, I think, I think that's kind of where I'll stop for now. But, yeah. Uh, just to follow up uh, on what Max said about uh, you know, the fact that he doesn't see m much need for pure translation degrees anymore. I've been doing some, one of the things I've been working on at LinkedIn is to do some research on trends within the localization industry, employment trends. And one of the things that LinkedIn has is this vast trove of member data. Uh, so all the members, or most of them anyway, put in their job positions from you know, the year they started working up until the present day. Uh, you have their, uh, you know, what they studied in, in school. You have what they consider to be their skills. You have what other people consider to be their strong points. And so I can look back, uh, mining that database, and see how many people called themselves translator over the past 10 years and see what the trend is. And I have to, I have to adjust that somewhat for LinkedIn's organic growth, but not too much because when someone new joins LinkedIn, they'll generally put in their employment history. So you're not gonna see a sudden jump just from people joining because they, they also lift up the previous year. And what I've been seeing for translators is that um, over the past eight years or so, people who call themselves translators, a number of them were, were growing fairly, fairly smoothly. And then the last three or four years, it's been leveling off. And actually, uh, last year, it went down just slightly. And in 2017, year to date, it's gone down quite a bit. I've got to see what it looks like at the end of the year. But again, you know, I don't think there's a huge effect from new members on that curve. So I'm, so I'm seeing member translators out in the marketplace starting to drop off. So uh, 
this is not official. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be working on a, you know, some kind of paper that I, I, I got to make sure this data really is accurate. I'm going to wait till the end of the year, get all 2017 data, and then I'll try and publish a post about this. So I kind of support what you're saying. So I think that's really super interesting. But I wonder whether that has to do actually with something that might not be necessarily related to the number of translators, but to the way that translators describe themselves. I think that. Um, there has been a real strong push in the translation community for marketing, for marketing that yourself. That, that's been, um, you know, the last, I don't know, I want to draw my number here, maybe 10 years or eight years or whatever. There has been, you know, Judy is here, who is, who is you know, a well known um, marketing person for translators. So, you know, there's many people who, many translation people who, who strongly encourage translators to market. I think one of the results is the way they register themselves on LinkedIn. Not that they don't register themselves, but they rather than register themselves as a freelance translator, they register themselves as a company owner. For instance, um, you know that they are managing partner or you know whatever of um, you know a company. Um, part of the problem that with LinkedIn also is that it's really hard to register yourself as a freelancer. Um, it's very difficult because you have to say you are. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to criticize you. <laughs> hey, I have every right to criticize them. You know why? He, when we first met, he said to me, my name is David. Find the rest about me on my LinkedIn page. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> it was kind of. <laughs> well, I mean, so, so there might be other reasons. But, you know. I think I can look at the data and, and test for that, you know, look at people. Uh, who were called translator and now are not called translator and, and what job titles they're now called. It'd be interesting. It's a good point, but uh, we'll see. Um, so here's one for everyone. Um, there are two theses about how translation will go in the next 10 years, however long, however long you want to put on it. But, um, and it kind of relates back to the question that was asked of the panel earlier, which is, um, Translation can be seen as either this elastic need, there's this limited number of words that are going to be translated every year, or it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's either elastic or inelastic. Um, there are a limited number or there are there's an infinite number of words that are going to be translated. Um, and obviously if you subscribe to the limited number of words idea, then it's this idea of scarcity, right? And which is what the translators are afraid of. Um, so which of these two models do you subscribe to personally? I can start that and then you can tear me apart. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I'm gonna answer, I, I think, a sort of a parallel question. And that is that you know, I see the need for translation growing, continuing to grow. You know, People are getting more interconnected. The developing world is getting online. People are communicating more. You know, so, so I think there's more need for people to communicate across languages and across cultures. But at the same time, I really think MT is what's going to play into that space. And that, that a lot of that increase in demand is going to be satisfied by MT. And a lot of the work that's being done by human tran translators right now is, is also going to be picked up by MT. So. So I think I agree with uh, David. We do see, and you know, I've been in this business for, for many, many years, um, and part of the guild, we, we do see an explosion of localization. I mean, we saw most of you were at Lockworld. Lockworld used to be 100 people. There were 1,000 people there today. Um, and everybody has different titles, and I agree with you, you know, um, you can be a translator or a lock expert or whatever it is that they're calling themselves. But even in the engineering space, which is the one space that I'm very familiar with, we didn't used to see IBM or Dell or EMC or VMware or Cisco into you know, localizing anything. Now everybody's localizing everything. Because they're localizing, you have to localize. So we together <laughs> created this monster, you know. And even if they will tell you, oh, you don't need to localize any of this for Germany, we're really good in, Ger in, in English, so you, sometimes you push that over there, right? So. I don't see this going any other way. Data is such an explosion of data. And everybody can offer nowadays also, right? So when you think of that, everybody's 
can spin up their own WordPress website in two seconds. I don't know, but um, I do see um, as at least all the translators that I know that I speak, they all use some sort of MP. I mean, also because they're being paid by the word, which is ridiculous. They make very, very little money, right? So how can they push as much content to, to stay in this profession? It's crazy also, right? There's a lot of pressure for them to get paid. So I think any aid, you know, that, that they can get uh, is very helpful. But also translators, but, you know, my, this is my personal opinion, that they benefit if they get additional skills as reviewers, as PMs, as liaisons, as whatever it is. Can I add this slightly different? I mean, I, I totally agree with both of what you say. Um, the, there was a um, question asked in the previous panel about um, whether the, you know, the job of translators is safe and all that. And the answer was, you know, of course it is. And we all agree with that, sort of. But what hasn't been addressed, um, neither I think in, as far as I could tell, in localization work we're here is what is happening. And I, I think that's, I think it's a fact. It is a fact that, that there is a really strong separation among translators right now. There's a highly specialized translators who make good money, really good money. Um, I mean, relatively think you know I mean they, they make okay money and um, and then there is the the you know bottom half which actually is probably more than the half who is making less and less money and um, that is partly I think due to um, to um, empty post editing maybe and it's also due to a due to a perception I think um, that um, that we have entered a new time, and so it's it's okay based on having entered this new time of new technologies, MT, et cetera, et cetera, that we can um, that we can pay translators who are not highly qualified and don't market themselves as highly qualified, whether they are or not, um, um, you know, less than we did five years ago, and and I think that that is something that you know, so are translators safe as a profession? Of course they are. I think that there is no doubt about that, but there are still problems. I think for um, for a, a large number of translators having to be the price specialized. I think that's you know. incredible amount of pressure for translators. It's horrible. So, I our the Middlebury Institute. Train, still trains pretty elite translators. And so I'd like to think that there's still uh, a future for uh, very specialized translators who produce very high quality content. But uh, I can't take credit for the idea, but it's not something that I, I uh, have thought much about. But as we move into kind of the gig economy, uh, translation is definitely going into that space. And especially if we open up translation to copy editors and subject matter experts who are going to be uh, doing kind of the traditional translation related tasks, I think there's definitely more people getting into this industry, uh, but I, I definitely believe that there's a space left for those elite translators who can make a good living. Uh, my wife, I'm married to a, a, who, who, someone who I consider a pretty elite translator. She uh, translates um, French, uh, household name French cosmetics company uh, product names uh, into English. And um, you, you, she can't get translation memory suggestions uh, or heaven forbid MT suggestions because they would just influence her so much on coming up with these uh, names of products that will be sold um, in stores in America. So, you know, I, I think I, I think the market is going to only get bigger, um, and as long as our economy is getting bigger, by definition, we'll need more uh, translators. Does anyone else have any closing thoughts on that one? Um, so the next one. Um, kind of related to what you were saying about um, non-professionals, non-professional translators coming into the into the industry. Um, do you think that automation and machine translation specifically will um, create an atmosphere that will allow non-professionals like marketers, um, certainly bilingual marketers, bilingual um, professionals who are Essentially, they need something translated pretty quickly, and they potentially have a tool at their disposal um, so that they can 
do it immediately, not send it out for ten days and get it back. Um, do you think that that will uh, be something that we see more of in the future? Do, how do you think it will influence the industry if we do see it? Yeah, I'm not sure. So we, uh, I don't see that uh, happening anytime soon for marketing. I, I just don't. Um, so what we have is a content strategy, and we, I think we were counting yesterday, we have 163 million segments that we're dealing with of localization. Um, and a portion of that is for marketing, a portion of that is for sales. So we, because we are the center for the company, we parse different types of content to go through the very different workflows. And marketing will never, ever, ever forgive us if we put anything in there. We've tried. <laughs> right, right. Well, so, tried. so not necessarily, you not necessarily can't marketing, but oh, you, because I think marketing is, a, you know, it's a bad example. Yeah. Obviously, that would um, require a little more attention. Um, but say that you had something a little that, that wasn't necessarily going to go out in a high-level way for public consumption, um, but you have people in the enterprise who need something translated. Um, I don't know if you know of any examples that where that would work. I mean, that, that's what I was trying to explain. So we have a content strategy um, where you apply MT, just MT, for support areas, for example. Um, I think about a, a couple of weeks ago, the HR team actually themselves uh, bought some sort of a new um, I'm sure the name took fire. The name of the company doesn't come to me, but they bought an application for a chart that comes with its own MT because they want to know what's happening inside with the incoming employees. So they came up with that. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a second <laughs> before, before we copy. But yeah, we, we do different content types for different groups. You know, they can take different levels of MT. But we go from trans creation all the way to world. So we have all parts, different workflows for different departments. Yeah, I, I agree. Same thing at LinkedIn. We have different workflows. Uh, some things go through MT and are published raw. Some things are post edit and so forth. I will say that um, the bar is changing for what's suitable for MT. There's much more stuff that can be MT now than there could be you know, five years ago. I think that's partly because the acceptance bar among users is coming down. I mean, frankly, I, I wrote a LinkedIn post about this, about the, what, uh, what I've heard referred to as the crapification of language. Right? I mean, people just don't write very well anymore. And especially kids that are growing up today, if they spend their time on the internet, they're going to read a lot of crappy writing. And they don't realize that it's crappy writing because they see it everywhere and it sort of self propagates itself. Right, so people are much more accepting now of, of badly written content, whether it's machine translated content or just you know, badly created content. So that means you can use MT for a lot more stuff. <laughs> and uh, a lot of companies, uh, you know, LinkedIn's part of the IBM now, and so I spend a fair amount of time talking to the IBM localization teams. And I uh, sorry, I'm think. Sorry, no, <laughs> sorry, brain cramp, brain cramp. I, full disclosure: I worked for IBM before I worked for Microsoft, so that's why uh, that's why the confusion. But uh, you know, Microsoft, uh, the Windows team, the Windows localization team, is leveraging MT raw MT even for Windows, so especially their uh, their their web properties, um, and they'll MT stuff and publish it raw, so in, in software applications, not just content, and then uh, and allow, allow it to be post edited professionally or by users. So, so the bar is really changing for what's MTable. So we're trying to go the other way, the, the crapification of language. So we're actually, de, de, we're trying to decrop uh, with a lot of authoring guidelines. And so because now, um, besides globalization, my team owns content strategy, we have the, we're creating this mandate, you know, to create good authoring standards. And good authoring standards are the standards that allow for better MT, and then MT will be able to be fed to AI and that kind of stuff. So it all goes for better. The worse the content, the worse the MT. That's, I mean, in my opinion, but if you keep crap, you know, crap will come the other way. Decrap, crap, recap. 
Max or Yost, do you have any thoughts on um, on that last one? <laughs> One, I don't teach translation courses, but uh, I do work with translation faculty on how they teach. And when, in our intro to translation courses, uh, students really don't use machine translation. They're not really, that's, I, I think our, our translation faculty believe that to learn how to translate well, uh, you start with a, a, a source language and you translate into a target language. And you, you, being influenced by something when you're learning to translate is, is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, but I think that most of our translation faculty acknowledge that you know many of the graduates will then be asked to do machine translation post editing or use adaptive MT, for example. So I think in the more advanced translation courses, that's when MT uh, is brought in as a kind of this is the thing that we need to know about. Um, and I, I don't know if um, our translation faculty, uh, translation faculty are exploring. Um, when to deliver, when it's okay to deliver less high quality translations. And I think we're pretty focused on delivering the best quality translations, but um, we do, I think we do have a new uh, post editing um, elective that we're kind of pushing students to take that is exploring, you know, delivering, you know, five quality points of, of quality depending on how much you're, you're being paid to do that work. So uh, definitely it's on, it's on our radar in the, in the academic world of how to deliver different quality points. But. So last question, and we have um, four more minutes left. Um, so how do you think that enterprises will choose to translate um, the long tail of languages that have yet to be translated? Do, first of all, do you think that they will in all cases? And um, where they choose to translate them, how do you think that, that will be accomplished? Well, I think, you know, when you're talking about the, the true long tail of really obscure languages, uh, I think Facebook's kind of led the way there. It's going to be um, community localization. And as machine translation starts picking up those more obscure languages of better quality than machine translation, uh, I don't know what you think. Uh, it still depends on the company. So if you're talking about Google or Facebook, you know, obviously you want to go to as many languages as possible. There's many, many companies that should not be localizing that much. So that's why I was saying the first person I would hire this strategy is because every company that I've gone to is like, oh my God, we're gonna localize all, all of these, we're gonna invest all this money. But then at the end, it's like, this is stupid. You need to make sure you understand where your board wants you to go, where the business needs to go. And you can be an idealist, but um, you can get <laughs> and you have to be aligned to where the country managers need you, you know, and where the field needs you. But I wish, you know, MT could help way many more languages, and especially, I mean, they were talking about Africa. I've been to Africa many times, try to work in Africa many times, try to learn Swahili many times. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's sad that we are so advanced in so many societies and, and so behind in so many others, and, you know, very admirable, uh, uh, people like Translation Without Borders, Translators Without Borders, you know, where they're trying to, you know, they need the brains of friends and all these guys to, you know, make these engines better so that they can go and, and help them better and get very crisis situations and stuff like that. So I hope, yes, MT, go MT. Many languages, please. My, my program, uh, or my school uh, does eight languages, big, big eight languages, and, and that's it. So we're not really focused on kind of the long tail of languages, but um, we, we've got kind of napkin ideas to do, you know, certificate programs or some kind of training program for uh, people in, w with rare languages who maybe speak a couple languages and could, could learn the skills necessary to be a translator. Um, and you know, since since this napkin idea, some entities have been born, like Translation Commons, for example, that um, is free, uh, freely available training for uh, anyone who wants to explore becoming a translator. And um, it's a matter of just kind of making this information available. And um, 
if and it, it's also kind of user led. Like um, I think it was the Catalan um, uh, native speaking folks. This is a LinkedIn story, actually. I, I don't want to steal your thunder, but um, the, the Catalan users came to David and said, "We we want uh, we want LinkedIn to be available in Catalan, uh, and um, it's just there's not there's not really a market for it. Uh, they volu they were volunteering to do it. They just wanted it to be." <laughs> yeah, they actually made a video about why LinkedIn should, a very professional video about why LinkedIn should look like in Catalan, and they sent me the video, and then they came and paid a call, and I took them for lunch at LinkedIn, and uh, and I actually was pushing very hard to get Catalan localization at LinkedIn, but I just couldn't convince the, the powers that be to do it, so I tried. <laughs> I know, you want <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, the nation, the natives, nation, nation Catalina. Uh, one, one interesting little anecdote before we close, and I wanted to say that, you know, I, I've been talking a lot, of, a lot about MT and publishing raw MT and so forth. We don't do very much of that on LinkedIn. Uh, it's, uh, our focus is really quality. We have uh, an in-house translator team, so we have uh, for our top two language tiers, we have at least one FTE translator sitting in Mountain View. We, we pay Bay Area salaries and stock options to make sure that uh, make sure that LinkedIn content is well translated. So they focus on the really high high value and high priority stuff. And uh, when I joined LinkedIn, one of the things I did was was to decide I decided to start doing MT, which the translator saw as a big threat, but I think they finally uh, they finally come to accept it. But the reason I want to bring this up is that. I was looking for an MT person, somebody who could lead MT at LinkedIn, and I heard about this guy named Spence Green, who was at Stanford and getting re ready to graduate. So I, uh, I got together with, with him for coffee and tried to talk him into joining LinkedIn. But he said, he thought about it, and he said, well, I, I, I'm really interested, but I want to, I, I got this startup idea that I want to pursue first. I mean, if it doesn't pan out, then I might think about LinkedIn. So uh, I don't think we'll ever seduce him to LinkedIn, but uh, fortunately I found another guy named Mike Billinger who's sitting right there. <laughs> So I was able to seduce the LinkedIn. So. <laughs> anyway. He stole that from us. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, do we have anything? All right. So um, we're going to open it up for questions now. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the question about the, one of the first questions actually about you know if you were to set up your localization program you know what would you do and my question is to David but anybody on the panel too who who has a thought on this um, I'm in a situation now where I have people to hire and you know I'm the only person now and I have three people to hire and my first thought is I want an engineer you know I want definitely one of the people I want it to be very technical I need an engineer. And um, I work in a start. I work with a startup, so there's a lot of engineers around already. There's a lot of you know uh, QA engineers and developers and all that. So the response from our, from the recruiter of the company was, well, <coughs> you know, we have all that already, so we could use that. Uh, we could use you know that talent already, and we use a lot of um, co-ops or interns as well, uh, mostly engineers. And so my idea was, you know, great, let's start with that because I'm not sure how many people are actually formed in localization engineering. I think most people are engineers and then they kind of grow into a localization engineering role. So I'm thinking, you know, great opportunity for a new, you know, an intern engineer to kind of grow into a role like that. But the pushback I had from the recruiter was, you know, how do I make it sexy for an in, for a, a, a candidate engineer to come into the organization in localization? Like, you know, are they really going to do anything um, that is interesting and challenging and are they going to grow? You know, like it's really limited. And because of my limited technical knowledge, it was hard for me to give her a good answer. You know, like give her examples of, you know, how this person could grow. And I know they can. I just can't verbalize it. So help me please. Sure. Yeah, local, localization engineering is challenging and it's hard to keep people in that spot because it is a, a real niche. 
And uh, generally what I've seen is that you get junior engineers who are just starting out, or you know, interns or whatever, and you uh, have them be your localization engineers. And then as they grow their skills and they get better, then a lot of times they'll try to move to, say, a product group where they're building the application, something, something sexier. So if you want to retain them, you have to give them work that's as exciting as building a product. And I think building a, a, you know, a new localization system comes pretty close to fitting that bill. And if you say, okay, you're going to be responsible for designing and, and creating and envisioning and, and then building this system, then that's a pretty attractive proposition. So I don't know. I'm just going to plug the, the fact that our uh, localization specialization uh, is, is open to, we're, we're kind of targeting that at folks that have like a CS background. And we have probably half a dozen CS majors in our program right now with the, with the hope to potentially turn that into a future interna internationalization engineering program um, uh, with the hopes also down the road to add some computational linguistics and some stuff like that to the program to really make it very technical someday. What, what do you need done? Because engineers, that doesn't mean anything. What, what, what work do you need done? At the, at the company, uh, mm. testing, if you get into, you know, uh, internationalization of the product, which okay. is disastrous right now, for example, like, why do I have to talk to engineers about it? You know, it, it, yeah, why do I have to convince engineers uh, about why they're not so designing the product yeah, Are you in a situation where you need to find this person within the pool, the existing pool, or can you go and no, find it's from just, the you know, outside? No, in, in, in justifying the hiring plan of my hires is kind of the, the profile of the role. And because it's a, a company that is already pretty heavily uh, staff with engineers, you figure, you know, yeah, any engineering task, you can just so, ask the so engineering team, the job but description then you have that to, you write have the to job wait for a priority, yeah. right? Write the job description of what you need, put it out there, and I would look inside and outside. There's a lot of internationalization engineers. It's not a rare thing. It's a profession. It's a, you know, some people love to be in that. I mean, I have internationalization engineers that have only done internationalization engineering forever. So it's not a rare thing. But if you, if you need to hire from within, you might want to explain that this is to help the company go global and put it more from a strategic, like give them you know, a view of how they're going to help you or going to help the business. You, know, you can make it a little bit more attractive. But also, that's why I was asking what kind of engineering. So, so you're talking more like the internationalization and the test plans and that kind of stuff. But then you will also need um, CMS experts or Lingoport or Globalizer, you know, like different sort of uh, experts there. So you need to be a little bit careful on, on your definition. So it comes back to what you were saying about needing a strategist. And maybe that's your role, I don't know. But you need someone who knows localization and knows what technologies are out there. And can and then can guide those engineers, whether it's as an architect to design the system or a PM to to manage the work, or a little both. You might want to start with a, an outsourcing model first before you hire what you need. You might want to test some of your products to see maybe they're already coding properly. Maybe you know, can write, run some scans to see is it really bad, you know. Um, and in parallel, you can put some guidelines for internationalization. But yeah, you're gonna need help in, in some sort of shape, like either from a, a, an agency or from a, an engineering program manager that helps evangelize and then transfers the skills into those engineering groups. That's what we like to do. Like we will teach you, but then you keep it. Yeah. Are there any other questions? A fair bit has been said tonight about machine translation, and machine translation is one of two translation approaches that scales well. The other one that scales well is crowd translation. And very little has been said about that. And so uh, I'd be interested in knowing how you see that playing in static role, an increasing role, or whatever kind of role in the kinds of work that you're doing. Yeah, I personally prefer machine translation because I know I'll get a result right away. You know, crowd crowdsourcing may take a while. It may never, you know, the result I want may never come. 
and you have to manage, um, you know, you have to be sure to manage malicious translations and stuff like that. I, I have to say, I haven't done very much with crowdsourcing, so I'm not really an expert on that. I, mean, I used to feed uh, Google with Catalan, you know, so I was one of the crowdsourcers. But um, no, I'm, I'm not very experienced that, you know, when, um, Facebook started that way, right? The, the guy, I forgot his name, but has had, yeah, 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 he used to talk a lot about it, um, and then, you know, they make information translation. No, I, I, I haven't actually heard anybody in our guild that uses crowdsourcing, so. So I think, I think that the companies that are still using crowdsourcing, So I think that crowdsourcing is sort of, uh, I mean, as far as I can tell from my vantage point is that for some companies that have a model that fits the concept of crowdsourcing, such as Twitter, actually, Twitter is still doing crowdsourcing, I think. Uh, you know, you can see crowdsourcing in those companies, but I think that, you know, overall, the era of crowdsourcing, of large-scale crowdsourcing in translation is sort of limited to those particular um, companies and instances. Yeah, and I do want to distinguish between crowdsourcing where you're throwing content out and letting anybody translate it, uh, you know, paying them five cents a word or half a cent a word or whatever, versus community localization where you're leveraging your own members and your own community and there's a gating process for that and you have control over them, you can monitor their output and if somebody's, you know, sending in bad translations, you take them off the community. And community localization, I think there's a definite place for and you know, that's what Facebook does, and I, I'm not sure whether Twitter does community or whether it's true crowdsourcing. But. I'll just add to that, that um, as the program coordinator, uh, I'm res I have responsibility for the overall curriculum that our students study, and um, we have a, an elective course uh, called Crowdsourcing and Social Translation uh, just to give students an option if they want to pursue that topic, then they can, but it's not something that we have determined that should be required for all uh, localization students. It's an interesting subject, definitely. Hi again. Um, I wanted to touch back on the a topic of use of education as a content, and also Anna's uh, topic of the mandate, the short seller mandate, your company that you're currently mandating for better content, better English before it gets localized. Um, I'm in a situation right now where um, we've been managing the localization side, you know, creating good content, um, localized, but then we're, reali we're realizing more and more that the, the, the English content, the source content we're getting, that's kind of where the problems are lying. and. What I was wondering is kind of a strategic question for you guys is first, how do you uh, persuade people, uh, convince the importance of that, you know, getting the good source content, especially when for years we have been managed to, uh, to get out, you know, uh, localized content that's been out there, there's no problems, and we're managing to deal with this crappy, like you say, people are used to crappy English now. How do you, how would, if you had 20 minutes to say with the CEO team, I'm convincing of that, how of that, of that um, what would be your top points to, to push for where, that? Where do you work? I don't know. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> well, I would take Jean-Francois with you all the way up. Yeah. Um, no, but it's just the fact, well, I think your authors are actually local. Not just, not just Cambodian, you yeah. said they were anyway. Yeah, yeah. So how many different uh, writing groups do you have? Do you have like marketing, engineering, support? No, 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 do you no, have no. all of that? Yes, I mean, I'm just right now, I'm just focusing on, let's just go for product UI, for example. I mean, developers yeah. like developer English, you know, but I mean, still, even if you were to say, let's go with UI, for example. I'll, I'll just pick, I don't know, however you want to play it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you need to have a content strategy because um, even just having an offering strategy is not enough. So I would go, if you're going to your CEO, I would go with a content strategy and say this is what good, healthy content looks like. It needs to be modular, it needs to be 
brand compliant, it needs to be localization right, it needs to be well authored, it needs to be cross linked. So I would go with, you know, what are the attributes of that content and why is it so important and what is it causing otherwise? And we know that uh, maybe there's duplication, there's wasted time, wasted money, wasted resources. So maybe you put a little bit of a business plan there of why will this be better? You, you know that it will be better, but you need to be able to explain why. Is it gonna be faster, cheaper, less people writing it? less localization issues, you know, better customer understanding of the content. And in the long term, um, if you get there, you will be able to do MT. And if you do MT, you will be able to do AI. So I think, you know, that's where we talk about a strategy and say maybe these are the first pieces, but you can go and say, I have a vision, I want to get there. These are a couple of the first things that I want to get done. Maybe it's like, um, write with localization in mind and have an authoring strategy. And you can buy a few licenses. So you can uh, bring in some author acronyms, uh, licenses, for example, right? And, and try it out. And you try it out. Um, and um, there, there are some people that I know in the industry that are going to let you play with those licenses. And so um, you do a pilot. We do a lot of pilots and we do a lot of decks to show because not everybody's buying into what we know we need to do. So you we're really well prepared to the benefits of doing something like this. It's going to benefit your search. It's going to benefit your taxonomy. It's going to benefit your localization. So that's why you want to have a content strategy, I think. So going well prepared, but thinking for the business because when you go to the CEO, it's Faster, cheaper, faster to market, less people, you know, doing the same thing, that sort of thing. For company. One content strategy for the company. How many staff members she's asking? How many content strategists? Yeah. I, I don't look at it for product. I look at what does good content look like? You know, it needs to be well authored. It needs to be reusable. It needs to be modular. So I would put a person in each one of those attributes um, because those are true for any product. So you might want to find a baseline of what's common for you. You can email me. I can talk to you. Um, did you have something quick you want to say? Okay. I, was, I was just going to add one of the things I'm really interested in in our localization project management course is the idea of low-hanging fruit. And uh, I'm just surprised that your vendor hasn't come to you and said, hey, we see a business opportunity. We could help you uh, improve the quality of your translations by doing some editing on your source content that we would obviously get back to you. So uh, I think your vendor might be able to work with you on improving the, the source language. Many times you're alone or you're a small group, you can find a vendor to do what Max was saying and you can show the before and after of what a string could look like or what a GUI could look like or what a... Yeah, yeah, especially if it's really bad, it's awesome, right? Because then you can really make your points like, look with the way they're writing, you know. And so the worse, the better for you. It's best for you that it's really bad and you go to the CEO and they're going to like, oh, this is brilliant. I've never thought about this. But you also want to make it about your customer. Will the customer prefer door A or will the customer prefer door B? And you can do some A-B testing also, right? All right. Well, I think that is actually all the time that we have. Um, and I think there were some closing remarks. Sure. First, we could thank this panel for our wonderful conversation. Thank you. Okay, I'll wrap up quick because it's getting late. But, um, you know, Spence and I were sitting there at the back in the first panel kind of smiling at each other because when we started Lilt, we were hoping that people working on technology and people who are 
translators and people who are running the localization industry might actually all talk to each other at some point. Uh, and we were worried as having done MT research for so long and never actually talked to a translator. I was like, if this doesn't happen, then we're doing something wrong. And here we are, we've brought you all together tonight and you actually showed up on a Friday night after a long week uh, from all these different constituencies and, uh, and talk to each other. So I thought that was really wonderful to see. And um, that was one of our goals from the beginning with LILT. Uh, and it's happening tonight. So that's really wonderful. Um, and then I, I guess uh, another observation is that I think we're all in this together. I do worry that if we just work on the technology, uh, then it'll be one of these things where uh, if we don't bring the community with us, then we'll be you know, ahead of our time, but we won't have a big impact. And I think uh, it's just really important as the technology is changing so fast that everyone who's involved in this thinks about the impact and the implications and can help see where it's going um, and how to use technology in order to get stuff done in the world. Uh, we firmly believe that text really matters. Like uh, when people go out there in the world and they read stuff, it should be high quality content. They should love reading it. Uh, we've seen so many technology companies built around here in this area by just relentlessly focusing on the user or creating magic moments or whatever it is that's all about just extremely high quality end user experiences. We've tried to create that like in our products, but also we think that you know great text is how people have like wonderful and rich lives. And uh, obviously that uh, isn't where we are with fully automated MT. I think that involves humans doing what they do best, really thinking about language and crafting it. Um, and so it's cool to just have translators think about that and in the context of uh, how it's gonna get used in businesses. And it's nice to have another fellow academic here as well. So um, yeah, so anyway, this has just been a delight for us. Thank you very much for coming. I know you're all busy and this means a lot to us and have a great evening, bye.